Okay, it looks like we have a pretty good audience now, so I'm going to get started. Uh, good evening. My name is Daniel Bowker. I am a forester with Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed. Um, CPRW is a local nonprofit working toward the health and resilience of the Cache La Poudre Watershed. And we are a member organization in the Northern Colorado Fireshed Collaborative, and that's who's putting on this webinar tonight. Uh, it's the Fireshed for short. Uh, the Fireshed is a group of organizations representing federal, state, and local government agencies, nonprofit organizations, university based entities, research organizations, and watershed coalitions. And we are focused on working across land ownerships to increase the pace and scale of forest restoration by coordinating treatments for maximum benefit on the landscape and bringing fire back into our watershed management toolbox. Uh, a few things to talk about before we get started here. And if I can, there we go. Uh, the webinar will be recorded where we are recording right now. Afterwards, it will be emailed to you all in a link. Uh, it should last for about an hour. We've got plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, so please hold your questions, but you can put them in the chat or the Q&A while we're talking, and we will try to get to all of them at the end of the presentations. And please stay connected with us on social media and on our website. Uh, they're on the screen there at NOCO Fireshed and nocofireshed.org. Uh, right now, Megan, uh, our marketing manager, is going to run through a couple of polls, and we're going to find out a little more about our audience here, if you don't mind just clicking in on those right quick. And Megan, you tell me when to stop. There we go. All right, looks like we've got a pretty solid Larimer County, Boulder County audience. I'm interested in the other, um, but yeah, yeah. Thank you for joining us tonight. We appreciate the attendance. And we've got one more poll question, I believe. There we go. Yeah, do you live in a mountain community? We're trying to figure out who we're talking to tonight. Great, looks like we've got about a third of us uh, that are up in the mountains. So this, uh, this will be relevant to all of us for sure, but especially relevant to you guys. So thanks again uh, for joining us here tonight. All right, this point, I can get that to advance. I'd like to introduce our excellent panel for the evening. Uh, first, we've got a group or a co-presentation by Tony Vorster, who's a postdoctoral fellow at the Natural Resource Ecology Lab at Colorado State University, and Brian Woodward, who's a graduate research fellow also at NREL. And then we've got Katie Donahue, who's district ranger uh, with the Canyon Lakes Ranger District on the Arapaho and Roosevelt National Forests and Pawnee National Grassland. I think I got that. Uh, Brian and Tony are going to talk about current research into forest management treatments, things like mechanical thinnings, hand thinning and slash pile burning, prescribed fire, and how those affected and interacted with the growth and the behavior of the Cameron Peak fire uh, from this past summer and fall. And then Katie is going to connect those treatments and their influence on wildfire behavior to the bigger picture of how the fire shed, uh, the Northern Colorado Fire Shed Collaborative, plans and implements those treatments at a landscape scale. And while I'm talking about Katie and the Forest Service, I did want to mention, and she'll probably mention this as well, uh, but one of these large scale cross boundary treatments that we're going to be talking about tonight called Magic Feather, the Magic Feather uh, Prescribed Fire Project. Uh, the Forest Service is hosting a public online meeting tomorrow night, May 20th at 530. You can find out about that on their social media or on the Arapaho Roosevelt website. And this will be a chance for the community to tune in, figure out what the plans are for that project and uh, ask any question that, uh, questions that you all have about that project. So we're looking forward to that. Please join us for that. 
And at that point, I think I will um, jump off here, stop sharing my screen, and I'll let uh, Tony and Brian launch into their presentation. Great, thanks, Daniel. Looks like, uh, great. Looks like the presentation is showing. Thanks, Megan. Looks perfect, thanks guys. Um, so yeah, thanks Daniel for the introduction and uh, just really great to be here. Thanks to the Fireshed uh, members for coming out. Uh, Tony and I have been exploring interactions between forest treatments and burn severity and fires that have occurred across the state uh, over the past three years now. Um, Today, we're gonna to share some initial insights from our work uh, kind of across Colorado, um, but also discuss our ongoing work in the, in the Cameron Peak Fire. Next slide. So to provide a little bit of background, probably mostly a review for a lot of folks in this room, uh, 2020 was a very unique fire uh, year for Colorado. Uh, on the left here, you see a graph that shows the number of fires uh, in recent years in Colorado and then the acreage burned. Um, so while there were actually comparatively less fire events on the landscape than in years past in Colorado, uh, the total area burned from fires in 2020 was one of the highest in history. So we had the first, second, and third largest fire by area in Colorado all occurring in, in 2020. Um, the fires also burned in kind of an uncharacteristically late time of year. And you can see that in the graph on the right. Um, so most of the overall fire activity occurred after September, which is quite strange. Um, yeah, next slide. <laughs> so just to provide a little bit of background on what Tony and I are looking at, the types of treatments. Um, you know, as many of you know, forest managers in Colorado uh, in both public and private lands have, have done a tremendous amount of uh, forest management and treatments. Uh, across the landscape, really in an effort to attenuate uh, the potential fire impacts um, before they start. So a variety of these for forest treatments have been implemented and they include things like Daniel mentioned, prescribed fire, thinning, creating defensible space for the WUI, uh, all different types of treatments. Um, they vary with forest type and uh, social and ecological factors and they can add a lot of goals. Um, but one of the major goals is definitely to reduce tree mortality um, and promote the ability of forests to recover from fire in the long term. And a big part of being successful uh, in this mission is, of course, to reduce burn severity overall. But burn severity is a little bit of a loaded term, so I just wanted to, to briefly go over what we're talking about when we talk about burn severity today. So for our work, we're considering burn severity really from uh, multiple perspectives. We're using remote, sen remote sensing to understand uh, landscape scale impacts. And then we're using really detailed on the ground field assessments to understand how treatments might have reduced burn severity to promote tree survivorship, so ecological benefits, um, but also to reduce soil impacts that can, can lead to erosion, um, endangering watershed health. Uh, one example of our work to understand these interactions uh, that we started a, a couple of years ago um, is from actually the Spring Creek fire in southern Colorado, and Tony's going to speak to that now. Thanks, Brian. You can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so the Spring Creek Fire, um, as Brian mentioned, is in Southern Colorado. It's uh, kind of between Levita and Alamosa, if you're familiar with the area. Uh, it burned in 2018, and at the time of the fire, it was the third largest in Colorado, although it's since um, moved down that list. Uh, we've been working with managers in the area to evaluate the impacts of some of their uh, thinning treatments. Uh, these sites that we're looking at are dry mix conifer forest, and they were thinned about four years uh, before this uh, fire, with kind of an even spacing sort of treatment. Um, this, yeah, you can go to the next slide now. Uh, this map here shows uh, the treatments that we're looking at in black and burn severity uh, in color, with the uh, red being High severity, orange is moderate burn severity, and yellow and green is low and unburned. Um, just eyeballing this map, there's an obvious uh, reduction in burn severity in these treatments as measured by the remote sensing. Um, 
but is this difference just an artifact of the remote sensing, which, which is possible because there's um, some other factors at play there, um, or is it a real difference, an ecological difference that um, you can observe on the ground? Um, so we, we measured plots in treated and untreated areas to compare uh, fire effects. Uh, and those plots are, some of the plots here are shown in stars there on the map. Um, so the, the left image here shows uh, substantial differences between, well, it's the only image being shown <laughs> so far. Uh, this image here shows the substantial differences between treated and untreated um, as the remote sensing measures it. So this is what we were seeing uh, just with our naked eye in the previous slide. Slide, um, slide. But uh, is this uh, difference, the difference ecologically, ecologically meaningful? meaningful? Brian, are you getting feedback? I'm hearing myself. There we go. OK. Um, so uh, Megan, if you could click to the next figure now. Um, the, this right figure shows that based on field measurements of burn severity that take into account things like soil burn severity and um, impacts on the understory and the trees, um, there is less of a difference between the treated and untreated areas. Um, but the burn severity uh, is still slightly lower uh, in the treated areas. Now, the treated areas tended to have lower burn severity. Um, and most, most of the area, both treated and, and untreated, burned at pretty high severity. Uh, there were some locations that were treated uh, that did burn at uh, lower to moderate severity. And those are the plots uh, circled in red there. Next slide. Uh, we also looked at one key goal of forest treatments because you know burn severity is um, you know, can be kind of an ambiguous term. So uh, we specifically looked at tree survivorship. Um, that's one of the main goals of these treatments is to keep some live trees around after the fire to serve as a seed source uh, for post-fire recovery. And uh, there were more surviving trees in the treated areas um, with no surviving trees in most of the untreated areas. Um, although at time, um, even in the treated areas, some of those surviving trees were pretty sparse. Um, uh, but there were more there. Uh, the trees that did su survive were typically uh, the larger trees. Um, so far, the regeneration at these sites, even where there are some sur um, surviving trees, is minimal. Um, but we're, we're going to continue monitoring this area to see if that greater tree survival uh, translates into greater regeneration. And uh, this summer, we're going to be out there also looking at um, uh, vegetation differences uh, between treated and untreated areas. So in summary, um, look at burn severity in multiple ways. And um, in this case study here, um, no matter how you look at it, um, the treated areas did have a lower burn severity. Thanks, Tony. So to move on uh, up north, a little bit closer to the front range here. Uh, we're going to talk about two fires that are probably on the top of uh, many of your minds, uh, and that, that includes the Cameron Peak fire and, and to a lesser extent, the Calwood fire. Um, we've started research and on the ground monitoring in uh, the Cameron Peak fire uh, specifically, and we're taking a similar but kind of expanded approach uh, that we did in the, uh, the spring fire. So as the fire burned through many of these actively managed communities, um, we thought that this was a great opportunity to kind of expand the study and, and took, take a little bit uh, closer look at a much uh, wider area in an area that's also received uh, significantly more treatments than the fires that we explored in the past. Uh, next slide. So the first step in evaluating treatment impact on burn severity is, of course, finding these treatments. and. Um, figuring out where these treatments has, has happened, uh, the historical treatments across time, is actually a little bit more difficult than, than we initially thought. Um, their type and specificity of treatments, it varies a lot across agencies, and there's a lot of different uh, lingo that might differ across agencies as well. Um, so working with our partners at the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute, uh, we've been working to combine these databases in a way that preserves information about multiple entries within an area, so overlapping treatments, and this is a really common occurrence. Um, but that also standardizes the descriptions of the work completed. So that was kind of our, our first step. And you can see a, an example of 
of some of the treatment polygons there on, on the right. Next slide. <clears throat> so uh, after completing the, the treatment database, we went through and uh, kind of summarized the data. So over the past 50 years, uh, about 40,000 acres have been treated or previously burned within the, Cam within the Cameron Peak fire area itself. Uh, but the past wildfire accounted for a third of this area and prescribed fire accounted for about 25% of the total area treated. Uh, treatments were, were typically small. We found that they were about 15 acres in size on average, of course, with prescribed fires being uh, significantly larger. So at this point in time, uh, thinning has been completed on a small portion of the landscape, uh, particularly in relation to other disturbances like wildfire, uh, which is shown in, in dark red there. Our next step was to look at, at burn severity in the Cameron Peak Fire. Um, we wanted to, to do this using remote sensing as a first uh, evaluation and also as comparison to some of the other burn severity products that are available. Uh, so I put up an initial burn severity map here for the Cameron Peak Fire, but it's, it's important to note that with the late season fire and, and the snow cover at the end of the fire, uh, some of our efforts to effectively measure burn severity in the burn scar have been uh, hampered by uh, these, these spectral issues. Um, so we're gonna continue to uh, monitor the fire and update these burn severity maps as new imagery comes available and hopefully have some uh, refined burn severity evaluations for the Cameron Peak fire, as well as the other, Cameron, as well as the other fires that um, I've spoken to uh, sometime this summer. Um, so this this figure here uh, is a comparison of uh, re that remotely sensed uh, burn severity that Brian just showed across uh, different treatment types. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this right now, but uh, there's potentially some differences. But um, the differences uh, between the between the treatments are generally minor uh, when measured with remote sensing like this. Um, so we're digging into this uh, into a few. Uh, we're digging into this a few ways. Um, one is more sophisticated analyses to compare treated areas to comparable untreated areas um, that burned in similar conditions. Um, and then also on the ground field assessments that uh, they've already been started uh, to make field data comparisons that are really more reliable and more, more meaningful uh, between treated and untreated areas. Um, and then those field data can also be used to refine and uh, calibrate those the remote sensing maps of burn severity. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, the area around Shambhala Mountain Center uh, demonstrates some of the promise and challenges of evaluating the effects of treatments on burn severity. Um, so the, the map on the top here shows um, the burn severity and uh, overlaid with, with some treatments around uh, you can, you can see Shambhala and this and the scout the Bendelitra Scout Ranch there. Um, some treatments when you're out there look highly effective, uh, but others uh, not so much. Uh, variables like weather and topography um, can overwhelm any effect of, uh, of treatments. Uh, this area uh, pictured at the bottom there, uh, looking out over the landscape, is the edge of the fire. The fire burned uh, through this recently completed groupy clumpy treatment. And uh, from folks I've talked to, this also coincided with improved fire behavior where the winds uh, died down. So um, while it's tempting, uh, it would be a mistake to attribute uh, the, the way the fire stops right here to, to, to the treatment. It might've played a part, but there was also um, other uh, perhaps more important variables at play. Um, so this is the task ahead of us, is to disentangle these many factors. Uh, next slide. Um, uh, this picture here is now um, on the ground uh, in that area that we we're looking at across at the landscape uh, previously. Uh, this is that groupy clumpy treatment, and I just wanted to show a picture of what it uh, looks like after the fire. Um, it's still too early to determine which trees are alive and dead. That's going to sort itself out over the next few years. But initially, um, it looks like there will be patches within this treatment that have uh, very high mortality and also patches that have uh, low mortality. Uh, the trees with the scorched red needles uh, that you see in the picture here, they might, uh, they, 
they might survive. In fact, they probably will survive if they have um, enough of the surviving green needles there. Uh, next slide. Um, so still talking about the same area, if you go um, just, uh, just to the uh, west, not far away from what we were just looking at, uh, the fire burned through a very large treated area um, under more extreme weather conditions. Um, these treatments here clearly didn't stop the fire, um, and the mortality is very high uh, in both the treated and untreated areas um, up there. Um, uh, this illustrates that treatments are diverse and they can only be expected to result in tree survivorship or reducing burn severity in certain fire weather and topographic uh, conditions. Uh, but perhaps the incremental benefit uh, across the many treatments will sum to improve forest recovery across the landscape. Maybe it'll make enough of, of a difference. Next slide. So um, while our work is ongoing, there's a few uh, takeaways from the work so far. Um, one is that the treated areas represented a small area of the Cameron Peak fire, uh, and that continued investment and coordination by groups like this um, are really important to achieve uh, landscape scale uh, benefits like uh, watershed protection. Uh, another important takeaway is um, just to encourage the consistent reporting of treatment efforts. Um, it would go a, a long way uh, for research efforts like this and also uh, I'm sure for managers uh, on the ground. Uh, we, have, we have found treatments to be effective at times. The difference can be minor. But as I was saying previously, perhaps these minor differences and things like tree survivorship can make a big difference in the long run as these, uh, as these areas recover from fire. Um, we're currently assessing the initial fire effects and we, this, we plan to continue this work to see uh, longer term impacts on things like survivorship, revegetation, um, and, and watershed recovery. Next slide. Uh, this effort is it's not just uh, Brian and I, so I just wanted to be sure to thank the many, many people um, who have contrib contributed and, and helped with this work, some of them uh, here today. So thanks a lot. Um, I think at this point, we're gonna hand it over to Katie. There we go, looks like I'm back. Um, okay, good, yep. Thank you, Tony and Brian. Certainly appreciate that. Lots to take in there on treatment effectiveness and that kind of thing. And I'm curious, and I think Katie will speak in a minute to some specific treatments and uh, you know how those did affect Cameron Peak and that kind of thing. But you know, one of those takeaways, and uh, it struck me, and you already mentioned it, um, was the reporting. You know, uh, we say we need to do more of these treatments and we need more money to do them, but we need to know what we're doing, uh, how effective it is, and we need to know where everybody else is doing those treatments. And so that's a really important part of this, being consistent in the reporting and that kind of thing. And that's really what the fire shed, uh, the collaborative is really trying to do is provide that kind of coordination and that kind of consistent reporting. So just wanted to mention that. And uh, I'm gonna stop my video again and, and turn it back over to Katie and thanks. All right, everybody. I think I'm unmuting myself and hopefully you guys can hear me. Um, I'm gonna apologize in advance. I am more often on Microsoft Teams than Zoom. So this is gonna be an adventure in technology here. We're gonna see how well I can pull it off. So I think this is my presentation. Uh, and I am gonna move this out of my way so that I can actually see what I'm talking about on my screen. Okay. Um, so again, my name is Katie Donahue. I am the Canyon Lakes District Ranger. Uh, so um, I am uh, the person responsible for the area on the National Forest where the Cameron Peak Fire occurred. Uh, and we are one of the partners in the Northern Colorado Fire Shed. Um, I really appreciated uh, the last presentation because I think it's gonna, um, they're, you're gonna hear a number of repeated themes. Uh, and hopefully I can kind of build with some different stories uh, to show you what we're looking at. So tonight, what I'm gonna talk about is uh, some fuels planning history in the area, talk about how we've looked at fuels in the past, 
what we learned during the Cameron Peak Fire, and these guys and their research is, is really the, um, the scientifically rigorous piece of that. I'm gonna talk more about some anecdotal evidence. Um, how we're moving forward with fuels planning now, and then how the Northern Colorado Fireshed Coalition uh, fits or collaborative fits into that uh, strategy for us as a partner. So let's see if we can advance the slides. All right. So in the last decade, our immediate area, um, so I'm assuming that most of the audience is, is approximately from Larimer and Boulder County, but um, our area has seen two of the largest wildfires in Colorado history. Uh, three, if you count the East Troublesome Fire, which uh, was over here to the west and happening at the same time as Cameron Peak. Um, when High Park Fire happened, and that's the, the smaller, darker scar there, um, when that happened in 2012, so less than 10 years ago, it was the second largest wildfire in Colorado history. Now it's been bumped down to number seven. Uh, and as Adam and Brian uh, mentioned, uh, the last year, 2020, had the three largest wildfires in Colorado history, uh, all in one year. So um, what we're seeing is a pattern. And if you're paying attention to the news and to the science, this pattern is, is being repeated elsewhere all across uh, North America and, and elsewhere in the world, that, that wildfires are becoming uh, larger, more critical, and more destructive. Um, wildfires don't respect boundaries, uh, and that's one reason why for us the fire shed is so so critical. Um, Cameron Peak, for example, burned over 208,000 acres. Uh, land ownership was national forest lands, national park lands, over half a dozen communities, 469 structures were burned, and over 13,000 people were evacuated from their homes during the course of the fire. Uh, the fire itself lasted 112 days from start to containment. For some of us, uh, it's continued to be a daily disruption since then. Uh, and, you know, as I watch the rains uh, consistently coming this spring, unusually, uh, you know, the impacts of the fire aren't over just because the fire itself is contained. Um, so carried on the wind, this fire moved across many jurisdictions and had no regard for ownership. So in the past, our planning has very much taken into account land ownership. Uh, so the map that you see in front of you, uh, it shows the High Park fire and some of our previous fire scars. The blue polygons are previous prescribed fire treatments. Um, so these are uh, what those guys were talking about in terms of work that had been done in the landscape. As you can see, they're very small, discrete polygons. Um, these are typically bigger than other types of fuel treatments, like cutting treatments. Uh, they can get up into the thousands of acres in our area, um, but they, they don't connect. And they, these treatments in particular, except for a handful of acres on Colorado state land, are typically mostly just on national forest ownership. Uh, so we've done lots of different other treatments. I'll show you a map that gets a heck of a lot messier here in a second. Uh, in, in terms of thinning the groupie clumpy that they showed you a photo of. Um, but we've really been trying to move towards prescribed fire as a bigger part of our program because we're able to affect uh, more acres. And the science that we're using shows that using fire ultimately does have a better impact on uh, wildfire behavior. Uh, now, as these guys said, that really depends on a lot of other factors, uh, but we're um, trying to do account for the most variables that we can at any given time. So as you can see, these tr treatments are not connected. Uh, the space between them, whoops, I'm skimming through my notes, but also apparently running through slides. Uh, this area down to the south below High Park, as you can see, did not have uh, any prescribed fire treatments and didn't have a lot of other types of treatments in it. Uh, it was actually, um, I'll show you in a minute, kind of an area where we were focused, uh, but, but those gaps in the treatments uh, definitely appeared to have some impact on, on where the fire went. Um, the size of these treatments and their lack of connectedness, uh, we definitely think was not nearly enough uh, to have a, a major impact on the massive expansion for the Cameron Peak Fire. 
So I'll talk a little bit about how we've developed from these smaller projects um, like those that you saw there into how we're starting to do work as a fire shed. So this map is unbelievably busy <laughs> uh, and I apologize for that, but I think it's kind of good for illustrating the point. Um, this map is uh, kind of on the northern end of the fire uh, and the fire is shown here in um, kind of pink shading, but this is kind of the Red Feather Glacier View vicinity as you can see, land ownership is unbelievably complicated. So uh, white is mostly private, uh, green is national forest. There's also um, state ownership like over here uh, and a couple of pockets in the middle. Um, so there's communities and, and different parcels that are completely surrounded by national forests on all sides. Um, the treatments shown in gray on this map are uh, fuels treatments, the lighter gray ones are cutting treatments uh, and thinning and um, uh, typically logging operations. The darker ones are previously implemented prescribed burns. Um, so you can see we'd actually done quite a bit of work uh, around the fire area, but that covers many decades of work. So these polygons don't, don't delineate how many years those treatments had been in place and how much regrowth had occurred. Um, so initially, like I said, we were mostly planning singularly on national forest lands. After the High Park fire, a lot of other groups started to get involved in planning for watershed protection, doing that hazardous fuel work. Um, groups like Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed, our host tonight, uh, the Nature Conservancy, other federal agencies like the National Resource Conservation Service, NRCS, and our Fort Collins Conservation District those are just a few examples of groups that were all working on, on fuels in this area. Um, so for example, when you look in the map, the sort of hot pink polygons uh, in, in and around that are kind of scattered, those are NRCS and Fort Collins Conservation District treatments. Um, so what we tried to do was really just start having conversations. Um, you know, Initially, we weren't coordinating projects. They were often happening near each other, uh, for example, the treatment that, that you just saw in the last presentation on, on the Shambhala Mountain Center, uh, we were treating very close to that area, just on the other side of the ridge, but those treatments didn't connect. Um, they weren't coordinated uh, at the time of implementation and, and certainly not at the time of planning. So in 2017, we really started pulling together all these different groups and started to coordinate our efforts. Um, a number of partners sat down in front of some maps and we've done a number of exercises where we literally spread paper maps on a table, put a pile of Sharpies out and started drawing circles about where we were trying to work. Um, what we discovered through that exercise was that we were all really looking at a lot of the same places. So we started to identify opportunities where we thought that we could start taking a landscape approach uh, and possibly having a greater impact in creating that connectivity that we're looking for in those fuels treatments. So this uh, is also a small busy map, um, but I, I put it in here to kind of show you over time, these, these conversations developed and, and we really increased our level of coordination. Uh, and ultimately we've built a shared vision about how we wanna look at fuels uh, on the front range. So, or the Northern front range, I should say. Um, some of the areas where the different partners are coordinating is suppression planning. I'm not gonna go into it today, but uh, we've done some mapping of a, a concept called potential operational delineations. Those are places where it might be easier to, to hold a wildfire or where it might be a good place for a fuels treatment to help hold a wildfire. Um, we're working together on prioritization. Uh, we shared a lot of, uh, of concepts, but starting to work together on where we wanna go next. Um, we're working together on the environmental analysis. That's for the Forest Service, that's one of the most time consuming uh, chunks of this. Uh, and other federal agencies have the same requirement. We're trying to work together and make our planning more efficient so that we can get work done on the ground more quickly. Um, we're working to, to define units together to, to identify what are those cross boundary treatments that would make a difference. Um, the partners are working with landowners. Uh, some agencies and, and partners are very good at that. Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed, NRCS. Uh, these are folks that are, that are, their organizations are designed around working with private landowners to do treatments and take care of their resource. 
the national forest on the other hand, our specialty is working on national forest lands. And we're the one of the biggest landowners, uh, we are the biggest landowner in Larimer County. So trying to um, utilize each group's strengths and where they best fit in terms of what groups they're working with. Um, we're coordinating burn operations. We share personnel when we're actually putting fire on the ground uh, and um, share our skills and our knowledge uh, and build our capacity to, to use this tool safely. We're trying to coordinate using uh, consistent communication. Fire is not easy to talk about. Uh, I've spent a lot of time talking about it in the last year, and I can tell you that it's very scary and emotional for a lot of folks. Uh, and we're trying to work together to build consistent messages uh, and communicate with folks off the same song sheet so that uh, we're easily understood. And then we're working together to compete for resources. Um, projects tend to get uh, a better shot at grant funding or, um, or large project funding if there is community support and collaboration. So we're using this partnership to leverage our individual strengths towards getting the resources we need to do the work. So as we started building these all together, uh, this organization, the Northern Colorado Fireshed, came to be, you know, really solidified into a, a strong and, and organized partnership. So these small scale and individual goals started to get built together into the vision that you see in front of you, which to really simplify it, it's just a ribbon of treatments from the Wyoming border to the I-70 corridor. Um, they will not be exactly in this green line that you see. Uh, that's sort of an approximation of where they would occur. Uh, some of them would be much, much wider, some narrower. Uh, but our goal is to build that connectivity and a, and a large catcher's mitt to really protect uh, all of the communities and the water resources and um, all the things that, that we value here on the Northern Front Range. So that's kind of where we've, where we've come to up until the moment that, that Cameron Peak started. Um, we were in the process of one of our first major fuels planning efforts with the fire shed. That was called the Jack's Gulch Project. Uh, I've given its general area here uh, with part of the Cameron Peak fire so that you can see that we identified an area that, that we knew was of concern uh, and that we knew we wanted to do work. We uh, been building off previous prescribed fire efforts like the um, Pingree Hill and Dad Bennett burns that you see there. Uh, this project had a, an all lands approach. We had some private landowners on the eastern edge uh, that were working with us and we were uh, really looking forward to connecting their landscape to, to the national forest when we did implementation. Uh, this project was going to work at different elevation, different forest types. Uh, and it included everything from backyards and rustic all the way up to high elevation wilderness. We were almost complete <laughs> with the planning process when Cameron Peak started. So um, unfortunately it was a missed opportunity, but it really it built and strengthened some tools and relationships for us to, to get moving on, uh, moving forward from here. So I am gonna attempt, I'm probably gonna fast forward through this because I'm cooking up my time here, but this is a Cameron Peak fire progression. Uh, and I wanna show you, uh, I'm gonna tell you a couple of examples of how anecdotally we saw some changed fire behavior during the fire. So here it is expanding through beetle kill pine stands for the most part, um, very little to interfere with the growth of the fire. You see breaks like this that are wind events. Uh, and then it, it hits the high park fire and starts hitting some of those prescribed burn treatments up to the north side of the of the um, the, the fire. And what we saw, you know, Cameron Peak is essentially a huge or sorry, high park fire is a huge fuels treatment. Um, so it didn't burn much into that footprint um, that really held it for a number of days until until we hit that massive wind event in October. And I'm going to fast forward here again a little bit. Um, the fire just sort of pumped around and started to fill in until we had that massive wind event. And then it moved right around the burn footprint from High Park and far off to the east and came all the way over to the edge where it got very close to Horse Tooth Reservoir. So what I want to show you with this map is just that these polygons where we did have a disturbance, a treatment, or a, a natural wildfire, they had an impact on where this fire moved. 
Um, this polygon over on the left that appears, that's our Elkhorn project that actually appears filled in, it's mostly unburned in there. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about a specific example or two here so that you can see what I mean. Oops, I'm skipping ahead. All right. So this is a, a burn in the Poudre Canyon. Uh, we had burned this particular unit in 2019. It's the Poudre Canyon Bayport Sheep Burn. And the blue on this slide uh, is the Cameron Peak Fire. And it moved down Canyon and essentially stopped at the edge of that unit. Um, I'm going to show you what the fire behavior was like that day. Uh, it's going to be really interesting as we look at these individually to see what the trends were. But in this particular case, the fire was ripping. So right up Canyon, there was major vegetation uh, removal. Um, there was not, there wasn't a significant die down of the wind that day to stop it. And it, it did appear to, to kind of halt at that treatment. Uh, in another place, this is actually the, just below that Shambhala treatment. Uh, this is our um, Pingree Hill burn. The fire was moving down the seven mile uh, drainage went popped back up the ridge line and it actually didn't spill as much as you see on the slide into our burn unit and it pushed off to the north around the edge and this is where it got sandwiched in between the two treatments uh, and interestingly um, it'll be really interesting to see what their data ends up showing about that Shambhala treatment because this was actually a great place for firefighters to catch it as it got necked down and, and much narrower. And I'm really cooking through my time. Uh, just to show you, this is an area that we had burned, this hillside. This gray is all that the Cameron Peak Fire did. It got into the grass uh, in that unit. Um, so it, for us, we were, we were very pleased to see that um, impact in our, in our units. So what's next? Uh, now that we've got this mounting evidence that we're on the right track with our planning efforts, our goal is to go even bigger. Um, forest service planning efforts are going to include continuing to build this ribbon of treatments. Um, we're really hoping to make progress north of the Cameron Peak Fire. Uh, our Boulder District is going to do some work down in the same rain drainage in coming years. Um, we're currently developing a planning area up in this blue circle uh, that we hope will be our next major planning area. We're trying to cover a big enough footprint that would allow us to to really take advantage of when partners have opportunity to do projects. We wanna be opportunistic and not have our federal planning slow down the process. So we're trying to take a pretty big, pretty big glance at what we might possibly do so that we can be a good partner within the fire shed. Uh, and then as Daniel mentioned, we're still implementing projects that are already on the books. So our first uh, big cross boundary project that was under decision is the Magic Feather Project which is a combination of a few previous projects and some private land. We're gonna be doing some burning in those units, we hope this year, uh, and those are kind of south and east of Red Feather Lakes. Um, and the public meeting for that is tomorrow night. And I will wrap up by saying, I just wanna point out our observations are anecdotal. And what we really need is the work uh, that, that CSU and other organizations are doing to determine what really are the variables at play, uh, but we feel really positive about what we're seeing for our treatments. Um, we don't know how long treatments will remain effective. That's one thing that we're gonna need to be looking at so that we can look at how often we're gonna need to do treatments. And we believe that the scale of our treatments is gonna have to be commensurate with the risks that we face. Over the last 20 years, we've seen dramatic change in wildfire. Uh, our fires are getting larger and our treatments are gonna have to be larger in order to have impacts on them. So. We have a lot of work ahead. I'm way over on my time and I'll shut up. Thanks. All right, there we go. Thank you, Katie. That was excellent as always. Uh, we really appreciate that. And uh, again, lots to take in, but uh, you know, I think a, a lot of really um, vital points were made there. And uh, we're gonna move into some uh, Q&A here and I've already got a couple questions lined up. I've got several in my head too, but just following up with what you just said, Katie, I mean, I just wanted to ask this again. Um, we've had a bunch of recent large fires in the neighborhood 
is the threat gone or diminished or is there a lot of work left to be done? And I mean, you kind of said that, but I just wanted to, to hit that point one more time. Sure. Um, you know, the way the way I presented it to my staff um, the day after containment was, well, guys, we've got another 400,000 acres under our management that hasn't burned yet. Right. Um, so we do not feel like the work is done. Uh, and um, and I don't want to have the same feelings of, of anxiety that I had during Cameron Peak ever again. So for me, those events and that fire were super compelling reason about why we need to continue aggressively to do this work. That being said, we understand how scary that experience was. And even those of us who live down in Fort Collins, not in the mountain communities, we're affected by smoke and all of the, um, the things that make fire scary. So one of the things we're doing right out of the gate before we jump back into burning uh, on a, land, like a broadcast basis, you know, a wider amount of acreage, is we do wanna come back and connect with the community. We hope that people will feel the same way we do, that this is, that this is evidence that we need to continue this work, but we want to hear those concerns and make sure that we're trying to address them for sure before we move on. Great. Yeah, thank you. Great point. Good point. Uh, so I've got some questions lined up. I'm just going to start going through them uh, as they came in uh, first. And this is probably for Tony and, and Brian and really Katie, too. But Tony and Brian have some of the data there in front of them. Uh, what difference did you observe between treatments? And this would be during Cameron Peak uh, in the lower montane Ponderosa forest versus mixed conifer versus higher elevation lodgepole stands. Did you have enough data to really see if there were differences in treatment effectiveness in those different forest types? Yeah, um, that's a, a great question. And, you know, I think across those different forest types, you're uh, thinking about the productivity of those sites um, and, uh, and the current fuel loadings. Um, so, for, for example, you know, if you can imagine if you thin a ponderosa pine stand, it, it's going to stay open uh, and not uh, accumulate fuels again for, for a while. So, those uh, treatments might. Uh, have, you know, might be effective for a much longer time. Um, contrast that with lodgepole pine and um, an area that's, that's patch cut. Um, some of those areas actually burn uh, pretty severely because you have a bunch of um, really dense, tiny trees and um, they can burn through those pretty quick. And that's when you, um, I think there's some questions there around uh, impacts of that on, um, on regeneration of these forests that we consider to be pretty resilient to fire, but if they were just treated, um, that could be in jeopardy. Great. Yeah, thank you, Tony. Yeah, it does seem to be, um, you know, differences in effectiveness, differences in size of treatment that's needed to be effective, and probably time since treatment, all that kind of thing uh, definitely varies, but I know you all are working to, to sort out all those details, and we'll know more. Uh, soon for sure. I'm going to bounce back and forth between the chat and the Q&A. Um, one in the chat asks about prescribed fire and uh, maybe I'll let Katie handle this. Uh, is there sufficient social license to increase how much prescribed fire can be put on the landscape? That is a really good question. Uh, we're constantly trying to feel that out. Um, I do feel that there's quite a bit of support in this community. Um, I came here after the High Park fire, uh, and I have heard from folks who've been here longer than I that, that community support has grown over time. Uh, we've had a lot of public meetings uh, and um, open houses for fire where only three or four people show up. Uh, we tend to take that as an indicator that people don't have a lot of concerns. That being said, um, we absolutely understand that the situation may have changed. So we're going to continue to check in on that. Um, we're going to continue to, to provide that transparency and open line of communication with the community so that we do go into this with a good sense of how much social license we have. Um, I also think the fire shed partners have been an amazing way to build that. Um, the, you know, having somebody like me in a green shirt with a badge come up to someone and ask how they feel about it may get a totally different reaction than, than Daniel might or Jen Kavakskis talking about exactly the same thing. So we're also trying to approach people where they're at and where their comfort zone is so that they're willing to share with us how they feel. 
um, so that we can go into these projects with that understanding. We're trying really hard to reach out to the neighbors and make sure folks who are impacted won't be surprised by what happens when there's smoke in the air. Um, all of those things, we're really trying to, to build that social license and build the trust to use this tool. But that being said, all of these things could change. So we really have to, uh, to be careful and respectful of the communities that we're working in um, to help them uh, be comfortable about what we're doing. Great, thank you. Yeah, excellent point. And I think, you know, that's that's one of the things that the fire shed as a collaborative is really trying to do, not just talk amongst ourselves about how we're planning these treatments, but really think about how we approach the community and, and allow them to tell us what their priorities are and what their concerns are and what they're comfortable with. And, you know, if an area is not good for prescribed burning, then maybe let's talk about mechanical treatment or, you know, um, you know, we've got to read that conversation and it has to be a conversation rather than just a planning exercise and then telling people what's going on. So I appreciate your comments there. Thank you. Uh, let's see, back to the Q&A. Um, since you're on here right now, Katie, as far as the partners who are participating, uh, is Rocky Mountain National Park involved in this process? Yeah, I mean, I would say that uh... We work with them in a lot of different ways. So they're they certainly have been participating in the in the fire shed meetings in terms of looking at the those bigger thoughts and, and landscape scale strategies. And then we also work with them directly as a continuous land owner and federal land managers to talk about strategizing our fuels treatments. They have a, a, a different approach, say, than the forest does to fuels. And, and like the individual landowners that Daniel just mentioned, you know, uh, whether it's the landscape or the landowner that, that kind of drives where their comfort level is with different types of treatments, the park is part of that too. Um, and they have their visitors are looking for something different than our visitors are looking for, for example. But absolutely, the park is um, very much a partner in this. And uh, we work really closely with them on, on trying to figure out how to solve these problems as well. Great, thank you. And so we've got a question in the chat about uh, a fuel map available with future treatments and that kind of thing. And maybe I'll just take that one uh, quickly. And you know, as a stakeholder, this person is asking how they can support these projects. And that is an excellent question. And as part of that community conversation we were talking about and that kind of thing, um, many of the Forest Service, and Katie, you can correct me, projects, once they reach the planning stage where they're in public comment, then a lot of that information is gonna be online and yes, you can find out you know, a lot of the details about what's being proposed and when the public comment periods and things like that are. Uh, as, far, as far as the private lands areas, you know, that's a little more sensitive just because you're dealing with the private landowner. Um, they have to deal with their neighbors and that kind of thing. So those won't really come out uh, on a map until we've got a, a, a good solid project in place and we've got the permissions and that kind of thing. But yes, as far as you know, your question, yes, these, uh, these maps are available um, and how you can support these projects is just by doing what you're doing right now, engaging in this conversation, asking questions. If there's a community meeting about Magic Feather, uh, show up online or show up, you know, in person once we get back there and ask those questions. You know, I think that's that's a great way to to be engaged. So thanks for that question. Um, back to the uh, the Q and A, and this is a this is a good one. So an average of 15 acres treated is pretty small, uh, given the size of the fires that we're seeing. What amount of treatment can have a real world impact on these large fires? Tony, Brian. Um, any insight on that or any thoughts on size or type of treatment that's gonna be effective? Yeah, and you know, I think first of all, um, to put that 15 acre number in context, um, that's also just the individual polygon sizes. They might be joined up with others. So when you start to look at it uh, on a map, uh, maybe it's joined up with other areas that are treated. But yeah, in general, you know, a lot of these treatments are, um, um, can be small. Um, and I think, uh, it's good to distinguish here as well of, are you talking about changing the spread of the fire? Like, uh, like Katie was showing some great examples of, or are you talking about reducing, you know, localized impacts? Because if you're the house in the middle of that 15 acres, right, then it's a, um, then it, then it's significant. Um, and it might also have, um, uh, you know, some ecological effects at the, at that small scale. So I don't, I don't have a good answer for 
which size uh, treatment might affect the spread. And I think that that de depends on so many other factors. Um, but it's, it's a good question to ask. Right. Yeah, it certainly is. And I think, you know, um, we're, we're doing some of that work to try to find these things out. And a good reminder from a researcher who's uh, watching right now saying, you know, uh, the goal of these treatments is not to stop the fire, right? We're not fireproofing the forest. We're not fireproofing communities. What we're doing is modifying fire behavior or trying to modify fire behavior. So like Katie was showing, some of those prescribed fires, um, you know, it's, it stopped pretty soon after it got into that. Um, and so that's a, an excellent modification of fire behavior as it gets into those burning treatments. Some of the mechanical and hand thinning treatments, while they are effective, and I think you know some of the data shows that, um, they're not going to stop the fire, but they may modify it to the extent that the firefighters have a chance to get in and, and do the work to slow the fire uh, as it reaches a, a structure or something like that. So, you know, there are different um, benefits and different intentions for some of these different treatments, I guess is the best way to put that. Let's see, this one I will throw to Katie. Um, as far as allowing camping and fires and smoking, and we could probably throw recreational shooting, that kind of thing into there. I know there's been a lot of discussion with the forest and with communities on what's allowable in certain areas and at certain times. Um, you know, what is the forest thinking about planning for maybe preventing some of these starts and uh, how is that managed? Yeah, so we are talking about fire restrictions and, and how to manage this summer. And uh, this is one of those times where, um, as a once long ago economist, you know, you look at all the variables that come into play. And right now with all the stuff that we've got piled one on top of another, it'll be really interesting to see which factors um, impact recreation patterns and then what our management decisions are. Um, we saw a lot more people in the woods last year by, by incredible factors because people were restricted from other things they wanted to do by COVID. Uh, so we had, the woods were unbelievably packed compared to normal. So sometimes it's hard to tell whether it was drought or uh, simply more people in the woods that might have led to an increased risk of, of wildfire. Um, we, we are looking to be more conservative, probably in terms of going into fire restrictions. Uh, however, the Camera Peak fire started during fire restrictions. So fire restrictions aren't a guarantee that, that fires won't be started um, and that human-made fires won't be started. But they are a tool that we use certainly to educate people about the risks uh, and and to to help, just like a, a prescribed fire or, or a hazardous fuels treatment, we're trying to modify the behavior uh, that leads to the risk. So same thing here. Um, we're certainly going to be out providing. Um, we actually have a prevention team coming in to try and uh, really get some messages out at the beginning of the fire season. So you'll be seeing a lot of social media blasts and and information and education from us along those lines about asking people to use fire safely and responsibly. Um, we were probably headed towards restrictions pretty early, but then it's been raining for the last couple of weeks. So we, we do have to balance that we use science-based indices to make those decisions uh, along with um, also the other things, the other patterns that we're seeing, these numbers of people in the woods. Um, I suspect that dispersed camping, for example, is going to be much more concentrated this year because the Cameron Peak and these troublesome fire closures are going to remain quite large uh, and slowly getting smaller throughout the season. So places where people have traditionally camped are not going to be available to them. So we're going to see more crowding in, in specific places. And whether or not that leads to greater fire risk is not sure. It'll lead to a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of challenges. Um, but it, there's so many little bits and pieces at play, it's kind of hard to give a very simple answer to that question. So hopefully that wasn't too convoluted. <laughs> nope, not at all. So yeah, that's great, great answer. And so we're talking about 
modifying fire behavior, we're also talking about modifying human behavior, right? I mean, a little B.F. Skinner uh, maybe could go a long way here or something like that. But we're just a little bit over. I, I want to um, get to another one or two questions, but I did want to remind folks that there will be a survey right after the webinar. As soon as we're done, it's going to pop up. And if you would just answer those questions, it'll really help us dial in our message and that kind of thing for what you know you all in the audience want to learn about from the fire shed. Um, but the last couple of things, and you know, maybe I'll just try to hit those and, and we'll wrap up because we already are over 6.30. Um, some, uh, a person asked, are there any grants or funding in place uh, for mechanical treatments on private land? And the answer is yes. And there is more money than there was before. Um, and that's something that you know, the Forest Service, they're looking at their own large grants, uh, smaller uh, organizations like CPRW are looking for those state level and federal level grants where we can put together projects on private lands that align with what the Forest Service and others are doing on the landscape, NRCS doing on the landscape. And another part of that uh, from another participant is asking, where can we get access to this fire shed planning map? And a really good source for that is going to be the fire shed website. And so that is, you know, we've been doing a lot of this stuff behind the scenes. We finally got it up on the web. We've got a good website. We've got a good social media presence. Um, a lot of that information is going to be there as well as the project planning and that kind of thing as these things come about. So that's a really good resource for that. And, uh, I think at that point, we do have a couple more good questions, but I better let you all get to your supper and uh, all the other things you have to do this evening. But I really want to thank our participants, Tony and Brian and Katie. Uh, thank you so much for being on the panel. I think this was really excellent. Um, the webinar, again, will be recorded and it'll be up on the Fireshed website. You'll get a link to that. And we are having our uh, third webinar in this series on... I'm going to make sure I'm saying it right. Uh, on June 16th at 5.30 p.m. again, uh, that's going to be about prescribed fire, an introduction to prescribed fire. We're going to have James White from the United States Forest Service. We'll have Daniel Godwin from the Ember Alliance, and they will be talking about prescribed fire on federal lands and prescribed fire on private lands and how those look similar yet different. And I think that's going to be a really good one, too. So. Thank you again, everyone. I think we'll call it a, a wrap and uh, enjoy your evening. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks.